Well, good morning, world. Alive again today. <laughs> Barely. Back to good early start. Sarah's back home. Healed up a lot since her surgery. She's good now. Now, what do I've got? I've got a lot. I'm going to read something from the late, great Bobby Short today, too. Uh, quick, I got a couple quick little tidbits. So, which where should I start first? So, get this one. What happened yesterday? I can't believe it happened. So, I had to leave here to drive to Nanaimo, drive along the highway, and pass a few cars. No big deal. I'm not an aggro driver at all. There's a Harley in front of me. I've given the Harley in front of me a good chunk of distance, as usual. Motorcycles always give them extra respect. And we're just cruising along, and, and I looked at the rearview mirror. And all of a sudden, here's a dark blue, newer car. Oh my God, what's that? What's the one of the four circles symbol, symbols on the... I, I'm not up to the cars. Fords and Chevs. Dodges, I'll tell you all about. But anyway, was an Audi, I think. Anyway, kind of a tinted windshield on it. And I looked in the rearview mirror, and I'm driving the white Tahoe, and it's got the N sticker on it for the teenager. Because I got the water container in the box of my truck, but I'm driving along, and I, and I just glanced up in the rearview mirror, and I, th I thought I saw this car like, right up on my bumper, right? I'm like, whoa. And then it veered right off and had two wheels over the double yellow lane on an outside corner. I'm like, whoa. And then it kind of backed off, and I'm driving along, keep my eye on that motorcycle in front of me, priority. Just driving along the highway, right? And then, uh, and I looked in the rear view mirror again. The car was regular distance off to the side. And then I noticed it kind of swerved over the yellow line a little bit again. I'm like, holy shit, this person must be hammered. There's no way that person's sober. One time, years ago, I had that. I saw somebody. There's no way they weren't right frickin' out to lunch. And I did call 911 because I thought for sure they're going to kill somebody. There's no way this person isn't going to kill somebody. And uh, I called I called the cops on them. Had to. Had to, had to. They were shit hammered all over the shop. And then we got hurt. And I'm like, holy cow, is this that... Is this going to be uh, one of those times? Should I be calling 911 or something? Like, there's no way this person is is sober or whatever's going on. And then driving along, come up straight away. And all of a sudden, it comes f ripping right up and is riding my bumper. Riding my bumper. I don't know who it is. And now it's like, holy, now it's threatening. And now I get my hackles up. This is threatening. And then I'm looking in the rearview mirror and I'm trying to keep me on the motorcycle, not to get my attention off that motorcycle. I'm like, this is a classic. I'm getting lined up for an accident here if I'm not paying attention. Pay attention to that motorcycle, keep it on the car behind me. And then it spurs right over like this and it's splitting the double lanes, splitting the double yellow lines right up in me. And I can't tell who's in the windshield. So now I'm getting, I'm feeling threatened. I'm like, okay, this is for me. All right. And then there's a fair line of cars behind back single lane and then uh and then kind of backed off a little bit and went over to this side i keep an eye keeping them out of the motorcycle motorcycle brake, so i started slowly break keeping my safe distance from the motorcycle he's driving along and all of a sudden this car comes right up on and i'm on a straight a straight stretch so it's not that dangerous for cars to see what's going on you no doubt the cars in the line behind me you can see what's shaking up ahead with this psycho and the or psychos I didn't know in the blue car. And then for me, I get to the point where I'm like, all right. So I, they're right up in my bumper. And this time I slammed on the brakes hard. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's go. So I slammed on the brakes and they managed to, I slammed on the brakes and then I kept going, but then I really locked them up again to double soccer. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I moved forward another little bit. And then I just, I just locked up the car right there stopped i stopped everybody and i'm looking in the rear view mirror i'm like all right this is stupid i'm not going to get involved in this road rage incident driving a vehicle down the highway possibly getting in an accident hurting a motorcycle who whoever we're going to stop right now right so i stopped and the car stopped nobody's honking as normally people would because they probably saw this freaking psycho in this blue car 
And I'm waiting to see what's going to happen. Who's going to get out of the car? What's this about, right? And, you know, obviously with shit going online, you never know that one in a million complete psychopath might have a little stock or whatever. So I'm not going to keep driving. We're going to do this. So just stop the car, figure out what's going on. Nobody got out of the car. And then I continued driving on. And then it came to where he split off. And then I slowly pulled over and split off lane. And uh, no, but then after that, I kept going. And then the car, so I kept going. I started going again. Then the car went right off to the side of the road on top of dirt and everything. Like the white line on the right side of the road and along straight away. And I was ripping along there on top of the dirt. I'm like, what the fuck is going on, man? And we got up to a turnoff, which is a turnoff to go to Coombs, if everybody's familiar with the highway. And then this car was coming up. Oh, and then after it went off into the dirt, then it came right up again. And then the sun hit it right. It's a big, fat, psycho chick. And she's in the window going, ah, where the finger's out. I'm like, what the hell? And then I so then I pulled over. When you go to turn right, and I just pulled over. So she had to come up beside me. But then she, come, so she just drove by going like this. And put her arm up so she didn't even have to face me. It's the most bizarre, bizarre thing I've ever probably, one of the most bizarre things I've ever had happen to me in traffic. A true road raging psycho. Check. Weird, right? How bizarre is that? And she's lucky. I mean, you start threatening people like that, especially if you're a woman. You don't know who you're doing that to, like that woman. If she's that much of a psychopath and she, whatever's going on, who having a freaking clue what's going on between the ears of that human being? But if that's how she's carrying herself through life, one of these days she's going to do that to the wrong person who's probably going to be a psychopath and him or him and his friends or whoever are going to follow her. And then what's she going to do? Do you know what I mean? That's a really, really bizarre thing to do. I don't like that. I don't like getting that ad adrenaline. I don't, I, I don't do well with being attacked. I can't walk away. I've already admitted it. It's my weakness. I can't do it. So I was getting, you know, you just getting adrenalized. Right? All right, something's going down. Let's make it, whatever. Very bizarre experience. Very, very bizarre. But that woman is, she's fixing to create her, create an episode in her life which she's going to have a tough time recovering from if she keeps doing shit like that. You know, there's a lot of loose cannons out there. Like, really loose. But anyway, thankfully it wasn't... I wasn't being targeted. Anyway. Now, what else? When am I going to start? I don't, I don't... I didn't take down... I didn't get anything uh, ready here. I got this ready to share from Bobby Short. And I'm going to say one more quick little item. I was talking to Sarah about this on the drive home. Now, how do you, you know, when you have a platform like this with a, a fair size audience, like obviously I don't give a flying shit what anybody thinks. I never tell people to subscribe, like, or share, or even come here, right? The door is wide open. If whatever's going on here interests you, you're more than welcome. You're gonna treat, be treated with, with respect. If you come here, you're not respectful. Well, you're gonna get shit on. You're not going to last too long. And, uh, but I don't try to, uh, I do not ever try to peddle my beliefs and make people believe what I believe in. Everybody gets the first crack at speaking. Take from what you will, leave it. All good, man. Speak away. And I know there is a fair amount of people out there who do get upset about Bible passages being shared on here. I get it. No big deal. It doesn't offend me. I don't get offended. It's just what we, it's just what it is. It's an open door. And we, we cover, we can cover a lot more topics than this one topic because this one topic does lead to other topics. Now I got to stop myself before I go off course here. As I go through life, I watch for clues and I watch for patterns on numerous different topics because there's a lot of strange shit going on and we have been misled. And once you know that absolutely for yourself, that's up to you to figure out for yourself. I have figured out for me. I know this is fact for me. Take from what you will leave it. We have been intentionally groomed since we were young. Period. So once you accept that as fact, then you really start digging. If you're curious and if you feel ripped off and if you want to see if maybe there is a route to take to have a better, more happier, fulfilled life life while we're here and help others 
for whatever reason, I'm about helping people. I can't stop myself. And that's why we're here. Um, now listen to me and follow me no matter what your stance is on the Bible, religion, religions, uh, beliefs, no matter what it is, just be patient for a second and follow me and play along, okay? Now as I go along, I have various little seeds planted in my head that I take note of. I don't forget them and I keep them right here. Oops, I take note of something over there. Oh wow, what was that? That's interesting. That fits with another thing I got going on over here from six months ago. Now let's just say, everybody, let's just say that, and I know the majority of the people do accept the Bible and what is written as truth. I'm not saying if I do or don't. I never have, have I? Because I like to sit back and listen to everyone and take from what I will or, or leave it. And that's how I ride through with various topics until I am absolutely certain. And then I'll share with you how I absolutely feel about that. I hope I'm making sense, but follow along. So we're all sitting in the room today looking for clues as we go along getting information. We're looking for clues. We're looking for patterns. We're watching for clues that fit in with shares, experiences, what people see, read. We're looking for clues. We're making sense of all this shit. So, let's just say Satan was real. Follow along. Let's just say Satan's real. All right? And the story in the Bible is real. Follow with me. Just be patient for you. A few who are impatient don't want to hear it. Just follow me for a second. Clear your mind. Open your mind. Now, let's just say you were here to disrupt mankind. You hate man because, allegedly, he was created in the image of God. You hate him. You hate humans. All right, note taken. Let's see. Is there any evidence of somebody absolutely hating mankind right now? <laughs> well, you got to admit, there is a lot of examples of hate Disruption being put on mankind today. Okay, yep, yeah, there's a lot of evidence of that. Note taken. Now let's just say the dirty, filthy bastard everybody refers to as Satan was kind of winning in a way. Cocky, his ego's getting out of hand, and he's pretty well basically got the upper hand. Right? Now remember, we're going on the line of the Bible. It's absolute truth. It's 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 real. Whether you accept that as real, I don't, it's not, it's not a debate right now. Just play along with my movie. I'm relaying a movie to you in the plot. We got the bad guy, Satan. He's doing a whole bunch of evil shit. He's causing, causing society to fall apart. A war on mankind and morals. Quality of life. And, um, he feels he's somewhat winning. And all of a sudden, Easter comes up. Right? But on the day of Easter, him or one of his disciples says, Oh, yeah, Easter? No, no, no. Today, and he's, you got to think about two, two sides warring in the background where the people aren't really seeing everything clearly. Just follow me for a second. Let's just say, No, no, today it's going to be, uh, it's not Easter today. It's transgender, whatever the hell it is, day to day. That's what we're going to recognize today. Right? Now, if the, everything is true, we're just, we're just relaying as this is a movie. Holy shit, does that ever fit like a glove as a clue? Would it not? I mean, Sarah, we're talking about this because she's on the fence. If, if I were a dirty, evil bastard and I was manipulating all the people down there and there's a good guy across the way over there and it's me and him going at it, I'm like, yeah, watch what I'm doing now. And then because I'm a dirty, filthy bastard, I'm going to uh, go absolutely against you and I'm actually going to get all the people to celebrate the transgender visibility, whatever the hell went down the other day. I didn't, I didn't even quite pay attention to it. And then as that's going down publicly across the masses, that dirty bastard's going to look across the way and go, <laughs> right? It's just, it's right out of a villain, out of a movie. It's, it's a full, perfect script in your face, but real. Don't you think? 
Anyway, that was one of the subjects I brought up with Sarah on the way home. And I'm just telling her, I go, all the evidence is pointing. There's a lot of evidence pointing to it. But that example on Easter, if this is a movie and there's a good guys against the bad guys, the bad guys just made a great big insult and stick it to you on Easter Sunday. Right? That was a little alarming for me. I'm like, as I gather all of my clues and I watch and I learn and I listen and that moment right there for me was a pretty big one. That was a pretty big moment for me as a little nugget of another indication that, well, hmm. Don't you think? Wow. Wow. And what is isn't on the American dollar and God we trust. The dollar's getting annihilated. You know, there's a whole bunch of shit out there going on that makes that makes you just go, wow. Note taken. So I'm just saying that move on Sunday on Easter, that was a note taken indication, and that little move was put on the shelf over here for another little batch of clues that I keep together as I keep an eye on this shit show going on today. Comment about it in the comment section below. Don't go off. Or just comment about it. Let me know what you think about that. Because that's... Uh, that's pretty crazy, right? Pretty crazy thing to do. That's an in-your-face absolute insult. To me. Now, what else? Uh, non Near-death experiences. Let me touch on this for another quick minute. And... Um, so, I do know a handful of people who have died and come back. Not a handful, I know a few. But I yesterday while I was cleaning the house, frantically, before I had to leave to go and just about get assaulted on the highway by a psychopath, <laughs> um, I turned on another video of a near-death experiencer and I just threw the phone on the kitchen table and cranked the volume while I was cleaning up and listened to another one. And... This woman described being out of her body. Everything had a goldish tint to it, like looking through sunglasses as she looked down at herself and looked at everything going on. And then I went, hmm, what? Because my neighbor back in Pemberton years ago, awesome dude, horseman, cowboy, salt of the earth man. And he was in his mid sixties. It wasn't the best shape. And I ran into him when I went back to Pemberton like a year ago. And I'm like, Merv, what are you doing? He goes, hey, what are you doing? Let's go have coffee. All right. We're sitting there, and I go, so what's new? He goes, oh, I died. I go, what? Were you what? He goes, yeah, I died. I go, you did not. He goes, I did. I'm like, holy shit. What was that like? He said uh, he was feeling pains in his chest, etc. And then he went down to Vancouver in emergency, I think. They put him through a stress test. And he's, uh, he went down. Boom. Went down. Had a jammer. And he said that he left his body and he was up in the far corner of the room looking down. I'm like, are you serious? He goes, yeah. And But he goes, like, everything had like a gold yellow tint. Like I was looking through sunglasses. Bam. Crazy, right? And that's exactly what that woman in the United States said about her experience. And her experience went on. But, uh, yeah. Crazy, right? Now, oh, anyway, so what I was getting at, my question is, so of the end of the near-death experiences that I've seen now, I haven't dove too deep into it, but I'm aware of it and it has my interest. I guess I could look myself. I will. But how many near-death experiences have been documented which has happened to a devout Buddhist or numerous people who are devout Buddhists? And have, and, and have had near-death experiences, I wonder what they saw. Muslims. Near-death near experience says, which have happened to devote Muslims. I wonder what their stories have been and what they saw and felt and heard and who they spoke to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Man, there's dust in here. <coughs> Took one down the throat. So anyway... <clears throat> valid question right because the non the near death experiencers that I've been listening to straight across the board they've met they feel they have met and spoke to angels God 
Now, what about the Buddhists? What are they seeing? Who are they talking to? I'm curious to know that side of the, the coin too, or the Muslims, etc. Right? There you go. I know there's a shit pile of people on here that are very aware and intelligent and you're digging all the time too. So there you go. <clears throat> now, this is from the late, great Bobby Short. She deserves to be heard. Again, now listen to this. This is titled The Dalton Bigfoot Stories. Quote, the first time occurred when Eddie Gunyon, a Yakima Indian policeman, and I were hunting elk on the east side of Mount Adams, Washington. I've been checking the trails carefully for any fresh elk tracks. I stopped by a little stream that crossed the trail and started to get a drink of water. As I bent down to get the drink, I saw the most amazing thing that you could imagine. A huge bear footprint. The first thing that hit my head, this can't be real. It was an imprint of a man's left foot, unshod. It was such a marvelous track that I stayed there and guarded it while I sent Eddie clear back to the reservation office to get some plasters so I could make a cast of the footprint. Eddie said he would be glad to go back and get the stuff for me. But it, but it wasn't anything to really get excited about because it was simply a Sasquatch track. I asked if he had seen them before, and he said it was the third or fourth time that he had seen one of these things. But this is the biggest he'd ever seen. The cast made, I got out my tape measure and measured the track, and it was 17 inches in length and 9 and 3 quarter inches wide. I took the cast down to Paul Deplain, a geologist and archaeologist who lived in Topenish, Washington, and asked him what kind of track it was. He said it was a big humanoid class of beast, definitely not an ape, and looked very much human to him. I stepped in the sand of the scene just to the left of the track and made an impression of my foot in the sand. I asked Paul if he'd ever seen a man that big, and he said he hadn't, and asked me where I made, where I made up the track cast. I told him I had made up the track, that it was r the real McCoy. He turned kind of pale and said, Oh my God, that's a big fellow. I asked him how big he thought it would be comparing the depth of the impression to the depth of my impression in the sand. He said, figuring as near as he could from the size of the foot and the depth of the impression, that it stood at least nine feet tall and weighed in the 320 to 340 pound class. I think he was off on the weight <laughs> from what we know now. I put the cast of the foot in evidence and wrote, a, wrote up a report on it and let the incident pass. I am sure, however, that it was not a fake because nobody would try such an elaborate ruse four and a half miles back in the woods on a trail that no man would follow more than once or twice a year. When I say backcountry, I mean backcountry, as only the northwestern woods can be. The second incident occurred in 1963 when Eddie Mespli, Mespli? M-E-S-P-L-I-E, -E, and I had taken our four-wheel drives up to his place in the mountains, one to help pull the other out in case one got stuck. We were trying to reach his summer home in the high country. Because of an early snow block on the road to the cabin, Mrs. Mespley was stranded there all alone without transportation. Anyway, any transportation out. We stopped our four-wheel drives when the snow got so deep that we were pushing it up with our bumpers. We took our snowmobiles out of the trucks, fired them up, and took off for his cabin, a mile and a half further up the road. When we arrived, every light was on in the place. I guess his wife heard the motors and opened the door to welcome us. She was sitting right in the middle of the living room with Eddie's 284 Savage laying across her lap. She said, I thought you guys would never get here. I've been visited by a Sasquatch. He's been messing around out there for about three hours. Since it was 10 p.m., we figured that he had come in about an hour after dark. Still not. Since it was about 10 p.m., we figured that he had come in about an hour after dark. Still not believing what we were hearing, Eddie and I went out and checked. Out the window, where he had peeked in, there were huge tracks in the snow. We could see where he had stepped to the window and see the marks where he had placed his hands against the glass to look inside. 
He had made one trip around the house checking all the windows. And then came back around to the first window where he'd started observing Mrs. Mespley in the house. She described him as being very tall and appeared as though he had to stoop over to see in the window. His face was covered with white hair except on his cheeks, mouth, nose, and forehead. The white hair tapered off onto his hairline. Sorry, the white hair tapered off into his hairline. His face was black, but not negroid in appearance. His hands, where he had pressed them on the window pane, showed long, tapered fingers and a very broad hand. She said it had very nearly scared her to death, but the, but the thing had never made an attempt to enter the house. She said he had stood there for his for a long time as though he were curious he left the window when he heard the motors of the snow machines coming whoa the trucks of course were starting to fill in by falling snow but you could see that they were easily 22 to 23 inches long and 9 to 10 inches wide when he left he wandered westward toward the eastern slopes of mount adams At the end, oh, is that the right, hold on, hold on, I just about screwed up there. Hold on a minute. <clears throat> we closed the house for the winter and took Mrs. Mespley down the mountain. Eddie and his wife seemed not surprised in the least and said they had known the existence of Sasquatch since their childhood but this is the first time either had seen one in person. The third incident was when I was on a bear hunt on the lower slopes of Mount Adams, Washington. I was at the end of a road right of way that was being cut through the heavy timber. The road crew hadn't started working yet and two lumberjacks were just cutting the trees in preparation for the boulders to come in and start their work. These two lumberjacks happened to be friends of mine. In Alaskan words, I guess you could call them real sourdoughs. When it came to logging, they had done about all there was to do. They were my good friends, Burl Thomas and Vernon Beeks. I'd gone to their camp at the end of the trail and told them I was going to look for a grizzly and that look for a grizzly that had been seen in the area. They told me that the snow line was pretty far up, but I better take my hip boots as the snow was still two and three feet deep in places. Walking up was fairly easy in the morning. I got, above, above, I got above the timber line. It wasn't long before I reached the ice cap. I was walking along the edge of the ice when I looked over toward the north where I could see a cloud coming and I didn't like its look. It looked like a really bad gully washer. I wanted to get off the mountain before the storm hit. The stream that I walked up was about a foot and a half deep and eight or nine feet wide. I just entered the ferns along the bank that were so thick that you couldn't see the ground through them. They were about as high as my head. I began to smell an odor that I'd never smelled before, a pungent odor that smelled a lot like bear cages in a zoo. The farther I walked in the ferns, the more nervous I got. I didn't like the smell at all. I thought it might be the grizzly trailing me instead of me trailing him, but I'd never smelled a bear that smelled as bad as this one. I had the terrible gnawing fear that I was being followed and I at once left the trail on the bank and stepped into the creek. I put the rifle in the high ready position and slipped the safety off. The last mile and a half to Burl's camp. It was pure torture. I expected to be jumped at any minute from the trail in the ferns. A very large grizzly could have stood on all fours in the ferns and never been seen. Don't forget the creek was running ice water off of the glacier just above. My feet were frozen inside my hip boots, and I was beginning to feel a little bit of hypothermia coming on. I stumbled into camp, threw the shell out of the chamber, picked up the cartridge and put it in my pocket and sat down on a log bench beside the fire. Burl had just prepared supper and expected me about that time, and had set my place and said, Come on over and sit, sit by us and have your supper. I was so tired 
not because of the physical exertion, but the terrible weighing down fear of the unknown that, I, that was so heavy on me, I was exhausted. Adrenaline dump. Verna looked at me and then a, took a second look and said, Why, boy, you look white as a ghost. What happened up in that mountain? I told them about the details of my trip and both grinned broadly and said, So you've had a run-in with the Sasquatch, have you? I went to sleep that night and was haunted all night by dreams of Sasquatch. I never felt the same about spending the night out in the wilds again. Hmm. Then the next little title here is The Snow Walker. The next incident was when Eddie Gunyon and Dalton Carr got called at 8 p.m. in the winter of 1964. Gunyon was a Yakima police car, also law enforcement. A party of two doctors and their wives had been driving over a status pass of Yakima, Washington to Portland, Oregon, when they saw by the road what appeared to be a man standing beside the road. Snow was falling. In the glare of the light through the falling snow, they could see they could see what kind of man it was and said that they were only traveling only 20 or 30 miles an hour through the snow and slush. The man figure was crowding the roadside and then turned to face them. They said he was like a man, except for his very large size, and that his face and chest were black with a thin covering of silver hair on his belly and chest, with the hair turning to long silver hair on his arms, legs, and back. He also had a man's genitalia, which gave him a very humanoid appearance. They estimated his height to be 8 or 9 feet tall and probably 400 pounds or more of body weight. The ladies had been so upset by the incident that the doctors gave them both tranquilizer shots. As soon as they reached Bend, Oregon... They got to a telephone and called the Washington State Patrol in Yakima. Since Status Pass was in the Indian jurisdiction, the State Patrol called us, called us out to investigate the scene. They told us that the point where it occurred was about 40 minutes from us. We headed out, and when we got to the place, I got out, walked along the road, looking for the place the fellow might have stood. I walked along by... I walked along by the front right fender, looking in the light at the edge of the road for about a half a mile, sorry, for about a mile and a half. I suddenly came upon a stomped out area, about four or five feet in diameter with big tracks, now filling with snow coming from the north, crossing to the south. The Sasquatch had stopped and stood and walked around in a circle in that place. The area was well padded down. We did a report and it was added to many reports that were already there. This was just another eyewitness account of many that have been... Ooh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Sticky pages. Damn it. Of many that had been reported through the years. Captain Wilson Lemire of the Yakima Indian Police told us not to file that report. Some newspaper man will get a hold of it and laugh us out of the area. So we put it in the pile of reports labeled, Not for the News Media. Laugh us out of the area, right? <clears throat> what an effective tool ridicule has been against humans. Isn't it sad that ridicule is an absolute... It's almost as effective as a freaking gun pointing at the crowd, right? Ridicule. Might as well be the same weapon. Is it so effective? Has been. Not here. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Betting and hair of known of no known. <laughs> Betting and hair of no known earthly origin. Quote: The most interesting incident occurred when C. E. Barnett, a government hunter, and I found what we called a Sasquatch nest. It was about eight feet across, three feet deep, made in the order of a cup. It was grass it was grass piled neatly to form the bowl. The mat was about seven inches deep. There were some mats that were crudely woven from grass stems that looked as though they were used for pillows. The nest was covered with silver hair, an inch and a half black at the roots, tapering off to a silver color. 
in the last six inches of the strands. There were several good handfuls that I took as a souvenir and we found some cracked nuts and where they had eaten some acorns and other nuts I was not familiar with. We also found where they had been eating tubers and mushrooms. The nest was very clean and looked like it wasn't a permanent dwelling, but a resting place along their way. I took the hair sample, sent one sample to the Smithsonian Institute. Big mistake. One to the Denver Museum of Natural History and one to a British Museum of Natural History. The note that I received from the Smithsonian was very non-committal and said, this is hair and not to be confused with plastic imitation. That was all. <laughs> they admitted it was hair, but didn't say what. The Denver Museum asked me a lot of questions, but never answered me about what the hair was off of. The British Museum of Natural History was very blunt and said, the hair is of no known earthly origin. This is probably the only honest comment of the day. Wow. I guess this just keeps going on. Whoever the Daltons were, I guess I gotta read back. Crazy, right? She did a lot of digging. Bobby talked to a lot of people. A lot. Let's read this one more, shorter one. 1951, Georgia shooting. During a three hour long distance telephone conversation with the late Ramona Clark Hibner. Back in the 1990s, she mentioned she had in her possession a report of a Sasquatch shooting near Boston in Thomas County, Georgia, that occurred in 1951. Ramona told me that the informant, a woman and her husband, had gone outside because their dogs were barking. They observed a giant man, described as upright and covered with hair in excess of 500 pounds. It was cornered by the dogs in the front porch husband shot at it and it leaped or fell off the porch. Additionally, the woman told Ramona that her stepfather found a single 20 inch long footprint outside his cabin the morning after. He calculated his height as seven feet. My notes indicate that at the time I spoke with Ramona, we both viewed her original interpretation of the Thomas County, Georgia situation with some skepticism. In Florida and in some southern communities of Georgia, the Sasquatch is called the skunk ape. It references the intolerable smell like that of the skunk. Other names used in Georgia were Wooly Booger, Booger, and the Happy Valley Horror, which is jargon associated with Bigfoot and in Coweta County, Georgia. Ramona Clark Hibner. There you go. I better put it down because I won't stop reading. How do you stop reading? How do you stop reading uh, what Bobby Short accumulated and, and uh, shared with the world, right? And I'll keep reminding everybody, how do you attack Bobby Short and try to disrupt her life and ruin her? How much of a dark son of a bitch are you to do something like that? Wouldn't you like to kick their asses? Anybody who torments and tortures a helpless lady, women, children... That's where men need to man up and go freaking bust their asses. That's how I feel about that. Bust their asses. Now, Mount McAdams? Mount Adams. Sorry. <sighs> What's wrong with my brain? Is it Mount Adams? Anyway. Um... You guys heard me, I have to go back in the video, but is there anybody around there with all that action around that Mount Adams? Somebody here has had something happen and you're sitting there quietly not talking about it. Give it up. <laughs> share my story, howtohunt.com, all right? We wanna hear from you. Just give it up and share it, all right? Don't be scared. Don't be scared. All right, what do we got? Here's another email in. Is titled, Question for You Regarding Your Outdoor Experience. Dear Steve, been tuning in for quite some time now. I've had my own experience with these beings. Most of the stories you read share a common thread, one I've heard multiple times and one I have experienced as well. The woods going silent, birds, insects, everything quiet. Does this happen... When there are large predators in your vicinity, such as wolves or grizzly bears. I know you have experience with large predators. 
would like you to share your knowledge. There are no really large predators where I live, but certainly have been silent woods. Thanks, Linda. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I've had a lot of experience with wolves and grizzly bears. I've had my hands on a lot of both. So that means I've had a lot of up close, intimate experiences with each species and know, know everything. Nothing, it does not go silent all of a sudden unexpectedly when there's a grizzly bear around. Mm -mm. Um, the only time that, they, okay, one time I was going after, there were so many wolves, it was absolutely ridiculous. And I had the hind quarter of a deer. And I went into these real thick, nasty bushes and it was old deactivated road to my right through the thick shit. Some pine trees, maybe 40 footers. And uh, I was hanging that, hanging that thing up in the middle of the bushes to attract the wolves to come in there. And I was setting up for them. And as I was doing it, I did have the feeling I'm like that I wasn't alone. Something's up. But it wasn't alarming. It wasn't scared. It's just the sixth sense. It's all it was. My instincts, my gut instincts, natural instincts. We got to come up with it. I have to come up with a, a term to use. So I just say it once. Uh, and I'm like, huh? And I'm looking around. I'm looking around. I'm looking around. Because there's grizzly bears there too. I'm looking around. And then I duck down so I could see. And there's three sets of wolf legs standing there about 10 yards away from me. Downwind. That's how thick the wolves were. It was ridiculous. They were actually pulling calves out of cattle while they were giving birth. They were taking dogs and cats off porches. It's just what they do when they overpopulate and gobble everything up. So that's how bad it was. They were. They could smell that. They could smell me and the deer and came right up boldly to downwind for me right there. But anyway, uh, I'm just telling you that as a one example of where I possibly, I possibly could have interpreted that as a dead quiet moment, but it wasn't. Not what people describe here. It was, uh, and what I've experienced in the past. Not at all. And obviously I have been face to face with grizzly bears. I've had numerous experiences with grizzly bears. Uh, a good handful of not so good. A couple few experiences of where I should have been dead and none None of those moments did everything go dead quiet. None. As an example, one time I was waiting by myself, barely seeing light, and I was waiting for a huge grizzly bear to come out years ago. And uh, a raven came over top. We were certain there was a kill in there, but not totally certain in a in this big mucky moose lick area. Didn't go in there, you could hear birds. And that's usually an indicator something killed something. So I set up on this side of the the area fairly thick where I could kind of see in there. We put a little bit of a tree stand. I'm only about five feet off the ground though, just to see up and into this area a bit. And you know, it was going in there. And then uh, a raven came over my back, cawing, and then went straight through and then up because you don't know where this bear is, if there's a bear. So, well, there's huge track walking down this old road. And that was an indicator. Huge. And then, um, uh, this way up north and then um then what happened so you don't know if the bear knows it's it's, it's kind of nerve-wracking because you don't know if the grizzly just watched you i got dropped off middle of freaking nowhere um you don't know if the bear just watched you walk up the old road you don't know where he is where he may be laying or if he's even there you don't know and then all of a sudden that raven came over my my left shoulder cawing down the timber dip the branches and then you could hear him go up and then stop and then ah 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 I'm like that's where he is there's a bear there i knew just from that raven i knew that's where there's a grizzly bear and that's where i should be facing and if there's a grizzly bear here that's where he's coming from because i figured if he had a kill if that was a kill i heard in there earlier then that raven's trying to disrupt the grizzly bear to hurry up and go uncover the kill so he can get a nighttime snack, an evening snack too, is what I interpreted it. Or who knows, maybe the raven was just telling me, he's right here. I'm going to give him a little disruption and make him get up his ass. And it wasn't two minutes later, this great big massive grizzly bear came dead. Sound. I mean, you can't hear shit when a grizzly, when, they're, when a bears are walking the timber, you don't hear nothing. Maybe the odd twig snap, but basically you don't hear nothing. It's just a big freaking dandelion. 
moving through those bushes, that thick fur, right? And then this massive grizzly bear came in front and then the rest is history. So there you go. There's a few, two incidents I can share with you to back up uh, intense moments I've had, but no, no, they, they, the, everything doesn't go silent. When it does go silent and everything goes in slow motion is when your adrenaline kicks in. That is a moment that can cause that, but not just walking down the trail, a grizzly bear, a wolf, nothing does that. None of those do that to us. Not what's described going on here. This is titled, My Stories and Reference to Your Must Listen. Oh, so here's a video of mine titled, Must Listen, A Family Has Going, ha, Sorry, A Family Has Ongoing Full-On Sightings and Experiences video. First, for you only, Steve. Oh, give me a second. All right, here we go. This man wrote in some experiences and a share or not option for his beliefs at the end. Hello, Stephen. All warning a long one. The name withheld to protect the wussies in these stories, LOL. <laughs> First, I need to say that I'm a Christian and will be making references to this later. Although, as reference information, I'm not trying to convert anyone here. My perspective is that I am saved. I know that I will die and pass from this physical plane, and I have no fear of that. So, to my personal experiences. Number one, I'm from Minnesota and grew up with a hunting heritage from my father, along with two uncles who heavily influenced me. And this is a down jacket, and there's just little fluffies of down everywhere. It's driving me kooks. <clears throat> Excuse me. My first experience... My first experiences were with bird hunting, duck and pheasant, on the farm that my mother had grown up on and my uncle now farmed along with surrounding farmlands. This means shotgunning, where 40 yards is a long shot. As I grew into my early teens, I also became, became enamored with archery, which is also a short range endeavor. You're not able to be successful at this without a lot of learning of nature first. I had a fire for the outdoors, animals, and wildlife from a very early age and for hunting that no one in my family understood. Let me read that smoothly. I'm sorry. I had a fire for the outdoors. Now I get it. Animals and wildlife from a very early age and for hunting that no one in my family understood. Passion. The friends that I made in school were like-minded and were others and where others were into drugs and trouble. We were into hunting and fishing, shooting and exploring. I was not introduced to rifles until my later teens and did not go deer hunting with firearms until I was 19. I was invited to go up to the northwest part of Minnesota to the Red River Valley area where farms were measured in hundreds and thousands of acres, not the 120 acre farms I grew up with. This is open country with many tag alder swamps, but the trees were patches, not woods, and those trees were alders and aspen no more than one and a half inches in diameter. I've hunted in that type of country. This was so foreign to the big woods in the north central and northeast arrowhead regions that I was used to exploring and dreaming of pursuing monster whitetail bucks in. Did we fill tags? Yes. But driving deer to posters just wasn't my way. So after three years of that, I informed my best friend that I wanted to move to the more classic big woods. After some persuading, I convinced him to start exploring the Lake Itasca area. Itasca? Itasca? I-T-A-S-C-A area, which, by the way, is the source lake of the Mississippi River. We soon found numerous miles of big woods and settled in our area of our opening day hunt of 1977. While exploring that area the day before opening day, Looking for where I wanted to hang my tree stand, I had an experience that, while spending countless day hours in the woods, I'd never experienced before. A tree fell in the woods. Yes, it does happen. However, what set this apart was that it was a glorious blue sky, no wind kind of day, just very calm breezes. The other strange part was that it fell about 25 yards away from me, and I was looking almost directly in that direction when it fell and it was a live tree, about 16 to 18 inches in diameter. 
There was no teetering. It fell over as if pushed by a powerful force. And now to the weird part. As I was looking in that direction, I could see movement. Except there was nothing there to see. Just a shimmering sort of thing. I stood there for a bit, and then walked over to this now fallen tree, and just could not understand what had just happened. After a while, I decided to get, I needed to get on with finding where I wanted to set up, so I continued along that ridge line. Several hundred yards east of there, I found the tree I was looking for, overlooking a yellow grass swamp that I just knew was the spot. I did not mention any of this strangeness to my friend or his brother, because they were both terrified of the dark and the monsters who lived in it. And I really wanted to hunt there. I got a beautiful 225 pound dressed out buck the next afternoon. Number two. We had moved out of that area the next year due to the political issue of local indigenous people who had taken over that area and had incorporated into their white earth reservation. So we moved several miles to the east and found some good new spots. My friend's little brother was not the best woodsman. And one day he did not return to camp. So we set off looking for him. We had about eight inches of powder snow, so we tried finding his tracks to follow. My friend went one way and I went another. After several hours of not finding his tracks, I cut a nice buck track. So decided to incorporate still hunting him and searching at the same time. I come down a ridge line into a lower area bordering a tag alder swamp where the buck tracks then led back uphill. As I rounded a brushy area off to my left, I heard what sounded like a herd of elephants crashing through the woods. Again, these are big woods, so visibility was somewhat good. However, even though the sounds were coming from a very short distance away, there was nothing to see. Except, once again, just a shimmering of movements with an added twist. I will not say there were footprints left in the snow, but they were more like depressions spread wide apart and heading uphill. Shimmering, loud crashing, depressions, and nothing else. It was late afternoon, so I chose to turn around and head back to camp. Of course, my little brother was there waiting. I never hunted that area again because I didn't need to. I never could really quantify any of this until I saw the Predator movie. I cannot tell you how watching that movie made me feel. As stated above, I continued to pursue my outdoors passion because I believe I know what many of these creatures are, and I believe that I am protected by the blood of Jesus. In fact, I go in to and out of my deer hunting areas with what I call severe dark. In what I call severe dark. Well, two hours before a light even begins to show. I wear all black clothing and carry in my camo or blaze clothing to change into my into at my tree stand. I do this because I've been shot at too many times over the years. Really? And I do fear idiots. I do not fear dying, but I do not want to die from idiots. All right, and then it goes on to just as much text with his beliefs, and it starts off Genesis, which we had to talk about that the other day. We've heard it 50 times, and I appreciate you saying that in, man. So I'm going to skip that, otherwise the crowd will revolt. And we just don't, we've heard it. We've heard it, we've heard it, we've heard it. There's nothing wrong with that. But we've heard it a kabillion times. So, there you go. The shimmering, what's up with that one? Got a lot of people that won't accept that as fact. It's kind of funny, isn't it? When you have, uh, it's a little odd when you have, say, a human being or a group. I don't know, whatever. So you got one camp that accepts the fact that there are large human type beings naked covered in hair with 20 plus inch long feet running around the face of the planet they accept that but the possibility of them being able to make themselves invisible pff, that's ridiculous <laughs> it's kind of weird right it's kind of weird for me, it doesn't take much for me to realize, to accept shit. Be, when you can think clearly, think for yourself, not be ashamed of looking into and be being curious and finding out. 
And um, there's just too much evidence that points to that the fact that there's just so much more going on with these beings than what the previous group of so-called idiots have tried to keep everybody believing. Right? You have to listen to your, your, your people. If you don't listen to your people, you're going to lose. Obviously. You got to listen to your people. All right? Thousands of people. Like I've said it before, imagine if I had the power to influence people. <laughs> imagine if I had that kind of power. Okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you in Sweden. I want two or three people from Sweden to wake up tomorrow morning and make up a bullshit story about seeing a large hairy being disappear and get it to me. And I also want somebody from Florida, Georgia, Minnesota, British Columbia, Alberta, and the Yukon to do the same. Now do it. <laughs> Said nobody ever. You can't make this shit up. Well, you can make up something, but uh-uh. What's this one? Fairly long. One more. My experience. Hello, Steve. First of all, thank you for your channel. You're doing what should have been done a long, long ago. But for whatever, but for whatever reason, it was not. Very much appreciated. No problem. My pleasure. I thank you for the kind words. The only reason is because of the internet. That's why. Not being around. I'm a pretty grounded person. I work hard, but I take my time to enjoy the world around me. I hiked from a very young age with my parents. I love mountain biking. And I used to be a serious cross-country skier. So I spend some time in the woods and mountains in all parts of the year. Nowadays, I work with bonsai trees, which requires me to go to remote cliffy parts of the mountains off trails in summer to find some good rugged trees suitable to train to bonsai and go dig them up come autumn or spring. Always have been an avid mushroom picker. My family and I would go to a particular spot in the Alps for 30 plus years and to some remote and to some more remote up the footsteps of the mountains for the past 15 years. It is a small population of bear there, deer, mountain goats, and a kind of a wild rooster. It can be a pain in the ass when they get territorial and all crazy. Oh, so we're talking, we're over in Sweden or something, or Norway. Seen those birds. Lots of videos online of those suckers attacking cross-country skiers. They look like they might be delicious. They get big and heavy and will shred your jacket to pieces if you won't give up unless you hit them with a heavy tree limb a few times. <laughs> no way. That's crazy. So it was wet and foggy early September morning in 2014 when I decided to go to the spot to pick up some mushrooms for family and friends. Everyone likes them because the texture of higher mountain mushrooms is much denser and richer in taste. But I had no such luck. Pickings were few and far between, and had a feeling it was a waste of time. This feeling almost suddenly went to, quote, you should not be here, end quote. That I had a few times before in the mountains, but never much more than that. So I shrugged it off to a bad day picking. I remember saying to myself, just to check under and behind the spruce that grows at the start of the steep descent. As I looked down and scanned for mushrooms, completely focused to find a good one, but saw nothing. I looked away again, and in that moment, I heard the deepest horse-like snort that was just centimeters away from my left ear and shook me to my core. My both ears pulled back, ringing intense, so deep, so mighty, so near. Volume-wise, it could have been the largest Belgian draft I'd ever seen. I was not ready for it at all. I did not think bear at the time. I tried to rationalize instantly. So I went from, holy crap, to, who the hell is the douchebag riding a horse that thinks this is funny? I looked the way the sound came from, and nothing. No trail, no horse, complete silence. Only then I felt fear something is not right. Something must be watching me and I need to get the hell out of there. Never felt such dread before, feeling hopeless, feeling being caught 
and there's nothing I could do now. I spoke to my parents, but they could not help me. They said nothing like that ever happened to them. I would not speak about that to anyone. Sorry, I would not have spoke about that to anyone if it was not for you, Steve. I felt alone, and I still am alone in this. But I don't mind telling my friends to be alert in the wilderness. When I guess asked why, I tell them we just don't know everything and direct them to yours and David's channel. None have come back giving me shit about it. Thank you again. We also have folklore of strange happenings in the mountains and remote rural areas from not too long ago. Being a very pagan nation originally, but people forget. Wild men, wild women, hound headers invading the lone homesteads and farms, dwarfs that live under the rocks and caves messing with wanderers, leading them the opposite way. But helpful spirits too. It's so confusing. Everything. But seems so far that, from most of our lives, so detached. So much just like stories. Having a small cluster of missing people from our national park they were never found in such a tiny part of the globe, makes me feel like we need to hear much more from every corner so we can piece together where we stand as a species. I'm 39, I'm still walking the mountains, but aware much more since. Sincerely, Gasper Gabriel. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> Europe, Slovenia. There we go. From the other side of the planet, again. Yeah, I agree. There's so much we need to speak about openly. It's the only way. It's the only way. Is listening to the people. That's it. Right? It's the only way. You know, here's one. To, here's a thought. The pattern, so far, one of the patterns, one of the numerous ones, is the message you had, you're not supposed to be here. Get out of here. Now, picture this one. And there's nothing there. Or something weird there. But anyway, picture this. Let's just say it's truth, it's fact. There is another dimension of parallel existence right along ours. And maybe some places, the barrier, the veil, whatever you want to call it, weakens. Right? Let's just say it weakens. And in this other dimension, there are some beings. Right? That possibly know exactly who we are and where we are normally. And all of a sudden, that veil thins somewhere. Like where this man was looking for mushrooms. And all of a sudden, that being sees you. But we are so dumb. <laughs> Should I use it with that? I'm sorry. I shouldn't use that word. We're so uneducated and unaware... We can't see them. We can't see shit. Then they come right up to your ear because they know you can't see you. And scare the living shit out of you. After or previously saying, you're not supposed to be here. Get out of here. Right? That kind of fits. If you're trying to even think up an answer for how the hell to explain a situation like this man had. That somewhat fits, doesn't it? Let's just say something's going on all around us. We can't see it. We haven't a freaking clue. And when that... Barrier gets a little thin in spots at times for whatever reason. I don't know. Then the people, the beings, whoever exists there full time, possibly already know about us, sees it thinning out. Oh, there's a human coming this way. Get out of here. You're going to die. Get out of here. That fits, doesn't it? If you're trying to figure the shit out and come out of different directions, that fits pretty good. Don't you think? That fits real good. Anyway, <clears throat> that's enough dabbing for today. I'm going to go. Um, one more question I got. And please don't fill my inbox of my email with the answer, okay? Throw it down in the comment section of this video. I'll check it out. In the past, it's been made well aware that various human beings, right? Various people, various stages in history have removed... Uh, sections of the Bible. So, if I wanted to read the Bible from one end to the other, obviously, if I know of a book that apparently is 
ages old, but it's been it's been changed. <laughs> I'm not gonna read it. I'm not gonna read anything that's been changed by human beings along its ride. I want the original, the one that the majority of the people who know, who study, who read, who look for answers. I want to know the version, which is untouched, allegedly untouched, unmolested, since original publication. I want to know which one to get, because I'm going to read it. All right, do not fill my inbox with the answer, because there's so many people here, it'll just get absolutely cluttered, and it takes, it's, it's right now, I think I'm at 96% of my inboxes that I paid extra money to hold all the emails. It's at 96%. An example, I had to go through emails because I don't like deleting emails from all of you. And I had to, it took me a half an hour to get it down to 94% of deleting crap emails. So please don't F up my inbox. Just throw it down, the answer to my question in the comment section below this email, please. And if your email starts off with, Steve, I know you said not to put it in your inbox, but... I'm just going to delete it. I'm not going to read it. That's the, only way I can, that's the only way I can do it to stop people from doing that. If I'm asking them not to do something, don't say, I know you asked me not to do the people not to do this, but no, I mean it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete it. All right. And I have to say that because you don't understand what goes on in my inboxes. If you saw my inbox, your eyes would bug out of your freaking heads. Okay. Please just comment in the comment section below and give me a few receipts of why um, the, that version is the version that has been molested and stuff taken out from our eyesight. All right. I'm going to read it. I want to read it. I'm curious. I got another book I just got in the mail called the, uh, the art of war, 2,500 year old book. I'm going to read that right now. And what I might do is I might sign it. And then I might pick somebody randomly here and ship it off to them for free and get them to read it. And then they can sign it and do the same and just keep it circulating as books should be. Books on that note, still have a few things I need to do. My soft cover book has a lot of color photos in it. I believe that's why it's been so expensive to get them made. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have to, the only way I, I made the hardcover be available in black and white glossy pages, but I'm thinking I screwed up. So I got on there to find out how to republish the hardcover in color said I have to unpublish the book and do it all over again. Oh shit. So I guess I better do that. And as well too, I'm trying to find out right now before I do all the correct pricing and the whole nine yards on those books, I'm trying to figure out if I need to learn if there is a better way here in Canada to get your book printed besides Amazon. Cause I got a funny, my gut scream and this is the wrong thing to do going through Amazon. But right now, it's all I got. So if anybody out, out there knows of the correct place to get your books hard and soft cover printed in Canada or wherever, to not get it done by Amazon, please let me know. I need to do this ASAP. All right. So I'm going to um, republish the book to make sure that the hardcover is all full glossy color photos just because it needs to be. I know not too many people want it anyway, but I think I want one. And then I will keep the soft cover book is in matte color photos. So it's going to be possibly, it's 360 something pages in there. It's built it all out in there. And um, we'll keep motoring forward. But in the meantime, before I really say go get it, um, I need to I need to gain a little bit of knowledge first and make sure I'm doing the right thing <clears throat> because I lack a lot of knowledge in a bunch of areas I'm diving into. So I'm learning as I go in multiple avenues. It can get confusing with all the other shit on my plate, right? Quit the babble today. Let's have another little sip of that wonder juice. Vancouver Island, keep your eyes out for a shiny blue Audi car. There's a psychopath driving that sucker. Share my story at howtohunt.com. Get your frickin' unbelievable knowledge shared to the world through me if you want or somebody. All right? Just get it out. Talk about it. Don't be scared of people, man. 
And you gotta admit, <clears throat> if there is a true battle of good and evil going on on this planet, that move on Easter by the uh, American government, <laughs> that was a pretty good insult spit in your face for that as being a clue. For me, anyway, that was like a, whoa, wow. Right? That was quite the uh, statement made. If it was the if it's the dark side represented by a group of people there, that was definitely a clue for me of the battle between good and evil, without a doubt. See you tomorrow. <laughs>